Hello, this is Dr. John Lynch at the University of Washington School of Medicine, and I'm here to talk to you about the anatomy and infections of the upper airway. By the end of this module, you'll be able to describe some of the basic anatomy of the head and neck and how these structures contribute to infections. You'll understand the difference between a commensal and pathogenic microorganism in the upper airway, recognize some specific infectious disease syndromes involving the same space, and of course, recognize some of the bacterial species associated with these syndromes. Let's start off by reviewing the case of Irina, the young girl with orbital cellulitis. If you recall, she presented to her mother with what sounds like an upper respiratory tract viral infection. This, however, was complicated by what in retrospect was clearly bacterial sinusitis that in turn was complicated by orbital cellulitis. Somehow she went from having a viral infection to having a bacterial infection that then progressed into a life-threatening disease. And the question is what sequence of events led to this outcome? We know that bacteria accumulated in her sinus cavity and somehow transited across to the normally sterile space of the orbit where the bacteria is able to evade the immune response, persist, and replicate, leading to her presentation. And the sequence of events is really the important part to remember from this module. Infections of the head and neck have some key elements. One is mucosal tissues can either be sterile or very, very importantly, colonized with bacteria. Many of the spaces of the upper airway such as the middle ear, mastoids, and sinuses, are connected by small passages that can be closed off by inflammation. Disease in the same space is often the result of either direct infection by a pathogen, as you see in pharyngitis, or a sequence of inflammation followed by edema or swelling or fluid accumulation, leading to bacterial overgrowth and sinusitis. What's different about this part of the body? Well, you all know that the upper airway is exposed to a complex environment, including many microorganisms. As you sit there drinking coffee, eating food, or simply breathing, bacteria are moving in and out of your upper respiratory tract. We are all born microbe-free at birth, but are soon colonized as we pass through the vaginal canal, and bacteria colonize those epithelial surfaces. Many, if not most, of these bacteria are full-time commensals or colonizers. These bacteria don't cause us any harm, simply replicating, persisting in these epithelial or mucosal surfaces. But some are waiting for that environmental switch to turn into a disease-causing pathogen. Some of the bacteria that are normally colonizers are in fact pathogens, but they're living in asymptomatic individuals waiting for that environmental switch. And the most common environmental switch is some sort of inflammatory process. In the case of Irina and many other upper respiratory tract infections, this is a pathogenic virus that leads to inflammation, congestion, closure of those small passageways, which I mentioned. The bacteria involved are not surprising or unusual. They're Staphylococci, Streptococci, Haemophilus influenzae, Moraxella catarralis, and others. But the focus here is that these bacteria, and sometimes pathogens, can often be living in our airways without causing any problem, again, waiting for that specific environmental trigger. Part of it is understanding the simple anatomy. There are a few parts that are very special about the upper respiratory tract, including the sinuses. There's the frontal, sphenoid, ethmoid, and maxillary sinuses. These are all spaces in the front of our skull that are very close to some very important anatomic, neurological, and vascular structures. We know that the middle ear is connected to the pharynx via the eustachian tube, and the middle ear itself is then attached and connected to another complex part of the temporal bone called the mastoid air cells. And we're going to be coming back to each part of these uh, anatomy as we go through these. So I mentioned uh, direct infection, pharyngitis being a prototypical uh, case of that. Pharyngitis is simply inflammation of the tissues between the tonsils and the larynx, presents with a painful throat, sometimes a fever, and lymphadenopathy, or swelling tenderness of the anterior chain lymph nodes in the neck. Most commonly it's a viral infection, but it can often be caused by a bacterial infection. And you've probably heard of strep throat or streptococcus pyogenes uh, pharyngitis. Strep pyogenes is a gram-stain positive, catalase negative, beta hemolytic streptococcus that is sensitive to bacitracin. Beta hemolysis is complete hemolysis of agar, as you can see in the lower right-hand panel. Importantly, when you're on the ward, you may hear this referred to as group A beta hemolytic strep or gas, um, and this is the same organism. Group A beta hemolytic strep carries the M protein, which prevents phagocytosis, and some strains can carry exotoxin A, which is involved in toxic shock syndrome, a very serious and potentially life-threatening infection. Fortunately, in all these cases, it is sensitive to penicillin and other beta-lactam antibiotics.
But pharyngitis can be complicated, as in the case of sinusitis, the pharynx is really close to a number of important vascular, neurological, and anatomic structures, including the vertebral bodies. The back of the pharynx is right up against the vertebral column, and you can imagine invasion with streptogenes into that soft tissue space can lead to some serious complications. Other tip, more typical and more common complications include parapharyngeal abscesses, peritonsal abscesses, and retropharyngeal abscesses, some of which can be quite dangerous and life-threatening, but are all a result of the anatomic structure right next to these very commonly infected areas. Another simple infection that can become quite complicated is otitis media. This often presents as a painful ear, fever, irritability, and sometimes odorrhea, or clear drainage from the ear itself. Now remember that eustachian tube connects the middle ear to the pharynx. Any inflammation of the eustachian tube can occur following any inflammation of the nasopharynx. And as that long tube gets inflamed and swells, microorganisms can invade and replicate along the inflamed tube, creating more inflammation, a cycle of inflammation, and an effusion or fluid collection in that middle ear. And that effusion is prime territory for a colonizing bacteria to persist, replicate, and become a pathogen. Some of the bacteria involved in this are strep pneumoniae, H. influenzae, Moraxella catarralis, and others. Of course, there are a number of viruses that can also present with otitis media, but we're really going to focus on the bacteria at this time. As I mentioned, one of the most common ones is streptococcus pneumoniae. This is another gram stain positive coccus, like group A strep, but this one is catalase negative, alpha hemolytic. That means it's incompletely hemolytic and optic insensitive in the lab. It grows in pairs and chains when you look at it under the microscope. Virulence is increased in the presence of a polysaccharide capsule that helps resist phagocytosis. And it causes lots of other diseases, including pneumonia and meningitis. Now, I mentioned that eustachian tube connects the middle ear to the pharynx. Well, the eustachian tube connects the middle ear and the middle ear to this part of the temporal bone called the mastoid air cells. And this is really important because if you get an infected middle ear, you can, that bacteria can then transit into that mastoid airspace and cause another disease called mastoiditis. Mastoiditis is inflammation of the mastoid air cells of the temporal bone, presents with pain behind the ear, fever, malaise, and as I mentioned, is a complication of otitis media caused by the same pathogens. This is a complex piece of bone that's almost like a honeycomb or a hard sponge, and once bacteria get in there, it's very hard, and this can be a combined medical and surgical emergency, um, depending on how bad the infection is. One bacteria involved in, uh, in this invasive disease is Haemophilus influenza. Unlike the prior two we already talked about, this is a gram stain negative cockoid or sort of roundish shaped rod. You can see that on the right hand side, gram stain. And in culture, it requires a couple of factors, factor X and V to grow. Not all the strains are invasive, but the ones that are invasive typically have this capsule type B. Fortunately, we have a vaccine that's effective against it, Hib. Uh, that has markedly decreased uh, this type of invasive infection, particularly in children. Uh, Haemophilus produces IgA protease as a way to fend off the immune response. And again, fortunately, is pretty sensitive to a number of uh, beta-lactam and other antibiotics, including amoxicillin and ceftriaxone. So let's uh, bring this full circle around back to Irina. So sinusitis, the disease, one of the diseases she presented with, uh, presents with pain in the sinuses, fever, and congestion. I'm betting a number of people on this talk have experienced this common infection, but again is related to that same sequence of events where inflammation of the ostea, the connecting tubes between the sinuses and the upper respiratory tract, the drain mucus from each sinus, become blocked, get congested, and lead to overgrowth of what were previously colonizing bacteria in that same space, sometimes pathogens themselves in that same space, uh, growing, overgrowing, and in some cases invading adjacent structures. Just like otitis media and some of the other diseases we talked about, it's some of the very common bacteria, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus, Moraxella, Catarallis. But what changed, or is different in the case of Irina, is this invasion from the sinus space into the orbit. So we know that the same sequence of events happened for her, a development of sinus symptoms following an upper respiratory viral infection, this development of edema and transition of a sterile or colonized sinus space to an infected space, which allowed these bacteria that may have been colonizers or may have been pathogens to overgrow, replicate, invade into the soft tissues around, and through that 
thin plate of bone called the lamina papyracea, which is all that separates the ethmoidal cells from the orbit itself. And bacteria are able to move over as a result of that. So what we see here is a very bad outcome of a very common infection. And we've seen through the course of this short module a number of bad outcomes. Retropharyngeal abscesses, mastoiditis, orbital cellulitis, all as a result of expansion of colonizing or pathogenic bacteria as a result of the cascade of inflammation as opposed to necessarily direct infection. So again, some of the take home points here is that mucosal tissues can either be sterile or colonized, really, really importantly, colonized with bacteria. Many of the spaces are connected by small passages which are prone to uh, being closed down by inflammation or similar processes leading to fluid collections and overgrowth of bacteria. And disease can either be the result of direct infection by pathogens as you see in pharyngitis or is a sequence of inflammation followed by edema and bacterial overgrowth as you see with sinusitis. And all of those processes can lead to very complicated and uh, very difficult to treat outcomes. So I really appreciate your attention during this talk. I hope you have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.